Ladies and gentlemen, tonight and next week, your host on the America series will be one of the most popular stars in the history of American entertainment. Good evening, I'm Robert Taylor, here at home with Ursula and the children to watch a most unusual television special, Star Spangled City, a one-hour tour of Washington, D.C. And why is it unusual? Well, among other reasons, because it presents America's capital not as the news experts see it, but as a, as a family on vacation would like to see it. As my husband knows, the children and I have never been to Washington, so we're looking forward to this hour. I've had the pleasure of narrating this 60-minute armchair tour, and I'm proud to share it with you and my family. The following program is a Jack Douglas camera cake. Jack Douglas presents Star Spangled City. <laughs> The house, the hill, the shadows of three. From an elevated view, it doesn't look quite the same, but from street level, there's no mistaking the most famous house in all America. The address is 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, District of Columbia, the Star Spangled City. Promptly at 10 a.m., the gate at the visitor's entrance is opened, and for two hours daily, Tuesdays through Saturdays, Thousands of Americans are made welcome at the house where their president lives. The home of every American president, excepting George Washington. A short walk or drive east on Pennsylvania Avenue leads us directly to the Capitol building, the domain of the Senate and the House of Representatives. The cornerstone of the Capitol was laid in 1793, about a year after the White House ceremonial. Here's a rare photographic angle of Capitol Hill. A lot of steps to climb, but well worth it if only to see the Brumidi Corridors, so named in honor of Constantino Brumidi, the Italian artist refugee who at the age of 50 dedicated the rest of his life to beautifying the capital of his adopted country. I think it's very wonderful that you have a chance to see these corridors down here on the ground floor of this capital building because you've already had the name of Brumidi, the old Italian artist that spent 25 years decorating this building and you know something about his other work. But down here, he tried to give to the American people something of his appreciation of the birds and the flowers and the fruit and the, all the growth of this Ameri great American continent that he came to as a political refugee. And he was so glad to be here that he became an American citizen and an enthusiastic American citizen. As you'll see, as you glance around, You'll see the uh, profiles of the men that signed the Declaration of Independence. Here's Franklin right here back of me and all these others. I'm reminded of something he said when he first came here. Somebody said to him, what do you charge if we hire you to paint on this, in this building? And Brumidi was about 50 years old at that time. And this is what he said, and I quote, I no longer have any desire for fame or fortune. My one ambition and my daily prayer is that I may live long enough to make beautiful the capital of the one country in the world in which there's liberty. Constantino Brumidi's daily prayers were answered. He enjoyed 25 years in which to fulfill his dedicated ambition. Corridors once cold and bleak now reflected not merely the loveliness of his colors, but of his passionate affection for the citadel of democracy. We're looking now at the small tidal basin bordering the Potomac, and at the edge of the basin, a grateful nation dedicated this memorial building in honor of one of its greatest presidents. The Jefferson Memorial is, in the opinion of many, the handsomest of the memorials to America's first executives. Oh, what a brilliant shadow he cast through the early pages of American history. The shining intellect who proclaimed to the world 90 years before Lincoln that all men are created equal. And in the same glittering document, the Declaration of Independence, 
It was Jefferson who defined man's God-given rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The words are here. The memory of him is here at the Jefferson Memorial. Of the country's many structures bearing the name of the first president, the Washington obelisk is probably the most unique in design and without question the tallest. The lofty marble shaft soars skyward 555 feet. Conceived by private citizens, the monument was undertaken in 1848, but work stopped due to lack of funds in 1854 when the shaft had reached a height of only 153 feet. And hear this. The project was not resumed until 26 years later when federal funds were finally available. Inside the obelisk are 189 stone plaques or markers, tributes to the father of his country from cities, states, and even numerous foreign countries. But it is Lincoln, more than any 18th or 19th century president, whose spirit dominates the star-spangled city. One reason may be that only Lincoln, of the martyred presidents, met his tragic death in the capital city. Here, at what was once known as Ford's Theater, and which later became a museum. This is a copy of the billboard for that black 14th of April, 1865. Ironically, the play was a comedy. Loads of laughs. The presidential box looked like this just before Mr. and Mrs. Lincoln arrived at the theater. When the box was not in use, it was kept under lock and key. These very keys. The pistol was hardly bigger than a toy. It was big enough. The mortally wounded Lincoln was rushed to a house across the street from the theater. It would evermore be known as the house where Lincoln died. A handful of the selected few maintained the solemn vigil through the night and the early morning hours. But the actor assassin had played his part too well. In this room, at 22 minutes past 7 a.m., God reclaimed one of his noblest creations. From the Washington Monument, we can look across this long rectangular reflecting pool to the Lincoln Memorial, a memorial incorporated by Congress two years after Lincoln's death, but not completed until 1922, 55 years later. The night time is, I think, the best time to visit the Lincoln Memorial. It's quiet, there are a few people present, and the dim lighting, just enough to illuminate the statue, adds to the mystic, impressive atmosphere. The words at Gettysburg, the words Lincoln thought the world would not long remember, have been carved in stone so that posterity may never forget. The words of men, the altars of God. The building is typically Washington. A dozen others look just like it. And yet its contents are worth more than all the gold at Fort Knox, the archives of the United States. The lighting is very subdued. Silent but alert guards are conspicuously present. For in this glass case, dated July 4th, 1776, is the Declaration of Independence of the United States, the most priceless document in all America. The parchment is covered with a yellow gelatin filter to protect it from lights and daylight. In the display cases below are more words that made freedom ring. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights. These are not facsimiles, but the original completed drafts. It's only a long block from the Capitol to the Library of Congress. The two buildings comprising the library cover six acres of ground on the 16-acre site. With 36 acres of floor space, 270 miles of bookshelves, it's the world's largest library. As you enter the visitor's gallery, you're sure to admire a stunning marble mosaic, the Minerva of Peace, 15 feet high and 9 feet wide. The vaulted ceiling above the Minerva is painted in the ornate style of the Italian Renaissance. We all know of the 500-year-old printed Gutenberg Bible, and this is one of the three perfect copies in existence. But two years before Gutenberg, 
the giant Bible of men's was already in progress. Entirely hand-lettered, the Bible is the work of a single master scribe. He worked at his dedicated task for 15 months, and when he was finished, the illuminators, as they were called, took over and illustrated many of the pages. Truly a monumental work, the giant Bible of men's. At the National Archives, we saw the completed draft of the Declaration of Independence, but the very original draft, composed by Thomas Jefferson, is here at the Library of Congress. Most of the changes were suggested by Benjamin Franklin and John Adams. This now is Washington's own handwriting, his first inaugural address. From the pen of Lincoln came one of mankind's great documents, the Emancipation Proclamation, ending with the memorable words, and forever be free. More from Lincoln. The first draft of his Gettysburg Address. Note that in this draft, he struck out to stand here, substituting, we here be dedicated. And again, Lincoln, his second inaugural address, and one of the sweetest, noblest phrases ever spoken by mortal man. With malice toward none, with charity for all. Yes, it's a house of words, this Library of Congress, Words that men live by and cherish more than life itself. It will come as a surprise to most of us that America has a national cathedral. It is known simply as the Washington Cathedral, and though the foundation stone was laid in 1907, the cathedral is still unfinished, largely because no official funds are allocated to it. It is being built and maintained by donations from we the people. This impressive interdenominational house of worship is unique among the world's cathedrals in this respect. It does not have a congregation of its own. There are eight stone carvers in the country who are skilled in the Gothic style, and all eight are employed at the cathedral. Half a million Americans visit their cathedral each year to marvel at its size and to revel in the beauty of its altar. The candlesticks are seven feet high and the cross is almost as big. All are made of gold, crystal, and ebony. Even more impressive is the stone frieze background of the altar. It's an elaborate work carved in Italy from French limestone. The dominant figure in the frieze is a life-size Christ in majesty seated on a throne. While in the cathedral, you may wish to honor with a silent prayer two great Americans buried here. George Dewey, Admiral of the Navy, the hero of Manila Bay and a wartime president who sacrificed his health and finally his life in the pursuit of peace, Woodrow Wilson. They rest in peace at our national cathedral. In architecture, the shrine of the Immaculate Conception is a tasteful, imaginative blending of Byzantine and Romanesque styles. But there's more than architecture to recommend the shrine as the sightseers must see. To begin with, this house of worship dedicated to the Virgin Mary is the largest Catholic church in the USA. St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, for example, is only two-thirds as big in square footage. The shrine is open to visitors every day of the week from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., and a complete tour would involve at least several hours. There is, however, one spectacular artistic achievement you must see. One of the world's largest mosaics of Christ adorning the wall of the North Apse. Not even the camera can do justice to its size. 3,610 square feet of handset mosaic. This romantic looking mosque, strongly reminiscent of the Middle and Far East, has been called the Pride of Islam, and we know it as the Islamic Center, a monument to Islamic culture as well as a house of worship. 21 Muslim countries support the center. The prayer call 
is followed by a reading from the Quran, the Muslim Bible. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا دَاوُدَ وَسُلَيْمَانَ عِلْمًا وَقَالَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي فَضَّلَنَا عَلَى كَثِيرٌ I imagine everyone who travels, whether at home or abroad, likes to discover sightseeing bargains. Well, in the star-spangled city, one of the most impressive tourist attractions is possibly the least publicized. We'll see it for ourselves in just a few moments. Star-spangled bargain. It's odd but true that a museum founded by an Englishman who never came to America is one of the major sightseeing highlights in the nation's capital. The Smithsonian is not one building, but a vast complex spread out over half a dozen city blocks. We'll start at the Air and Space Building. Here on open exhibit is Friendship 7, the space capsule in which Colonel John Glenn orbited the Earth back in February of 1962. Except for the model of Colonel Glenn, the capsule is completely authentic, just as it was when the great astronaut streaked across the heavens. And look at that panel board. No wonder an astronaut has to be a very special breed of man. Colonel Glenn was just an infant when the spirit of St. Louis was piloted across the Atlantic by another colonel, Charles Lindbergh, a historic solo flight of 33 hours and 28 minutes. Also at the Smithsonian, a flashback to the Wright brothers, the first power-driven, heavier-than-air machine capable of controlled and sustained flights. Within a few years, this model will come to life the new National Air and Space Museum approved by the Congress. The present building is much too small to accommodate all of these significant aircraft and space vehicles designed by man in his conquest of air and space. The Smithsonian's Museum of History and Technology is a modern, marble-faced, smartly styled edifice that contrasts sharply with some of its antique treasures. The Benjamin Franklin Printing Press the press used by Franklin as a journeyman printer at Watts Printing House in London, 1726. Franklin's distinguished contemporary wore this uniform on December 23, 1783, when he resigned his commission as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. Of course, George Washington. This small box revolutionized and made prosperous life in the South. Eli Whitney's cotton gin, which separated the seeds from the fibers. And this odd-looking potpourri is the work of Joseph Henry, who took up where Franklin left off in the field of electricity. An electromagnet capable of lifting more than a ton. In those days, nothing short of a miracle. In the Smithsonian collection, there are some 400 paintings by Catlin, who more than any other artist, enabled the people of America to know and understand the Western frontier, and especially the real American Indian. Stamps? The Smithsonian has some beauties. Watch the sheet of two cent stamps and suddenly, the dream of every collector of five center. A human error that makes this sheet worth a king's ransom. Here's one of the most valuable stamps in the collection, a 1918 issue in which the airplane is upside down. Let's turn to famous gowns of the century. In a replica of the East Room of the White House, are these gowns worn by our first ladies from 1921 to the present time? And still on a political vein, the campaigns of the past are on review in the nostalgic Hall of Historic Americans. Old Abe, sold to the voters as the Prince of Rails. Henry Clay, U.S. Grant, Bryan, the perennial hopeful. Tippy Canoe and Morton, too. Sound Money and McKinley. Teddy Roosevelt, the Rough Rider. A memory lane of presidential political campaigns. The National Gallery of Art is also a bureau of the Smithsonian. Private citizens have joined the gallery in harvesting the fruits of Western man's artistic genius. For example, Van Eyck, the Annunciation. Raphael's The Alba Madonna. El Greco's Laocoon, a priest of ancient Troy. 
now the great Rembrandt and his self-portrait. And this is Vermeer's Girl with a Red Hat. A classic study from the French school, Madame Bergeret by Boucher. And in the Sacrament of the Last Supper, Salvador Dali gave us what may be one of his best remembered works. These and hundreds of other masterpieces constitute one of the finest art collections in the world. And it's yours to be shared whenever you wish at the Smithsonian's National Gallery of Art. The Museum of Natural History is yet another impressive branch of the Smithsonian Group. It's a storehouse of wonders. We'll start with this creative interpretation of the feathered serpent columns at the Pyramid Temple of the Toltec Maya people at Chichen Itza in Yucatan. If you're a student of geography and anthropology, you'll have no trouble identifying this monumental statuary, one of the many mysteries of faraway Easter Island. The sacred dance dramas of India are symbolized by this figure of King Bali, the virtuous, heroic Hindu animal god forced into exile because of the jealousy of Lord Vishnu, guardian of the universe. In these dance dramas, the actor and the character he portrays are believed to become as one as a result of intense mental concentration. Our own American Indians are portrayed in this tableau, the Hopi snake dance, a primitive prayer for rain in which the Hopi priests use live rattlesnakes. The snakes were considered sacred messengers that could communicate with the rain gods. The animal exhibits are incomparable. This one, a collection of typical African species, is merely window dressing for what follows. An African bush elephant, the biggest in recorded history. When brought down by a big game hunter in 1955, this colossus of the dark continent weighed 12 tons and stood 13 feet 2 inches high a foot taller than any other elephant of modern times. A 92-foot model of the blue whale takes up the better part of an entire exhibit hall. The blue whale is the largest mammal in existence today and possibly the largest that has ever existed on the planet. As for this monster from the early past, well, to have photographed him alive, you would have to go back in time roughly 125 million years. Now in the very same building you will see diamonds. Here's the Portuguese diamond which weighed 150 carats when mined in Brazil. In 1920 it was cut to its present size, 127 carats. The Napoleon necklace was gifted by Bonaparte to his second wife, the Empress Marie Louise, on the birth of their son. It has 47 principal diamonds, totaling 275 carats. And this Yes, this is the famous Hope Diamond, the largest blue diamond in the world, some 44.5 carats. Diamonds, wildlife, primitive customs, priceless art treasures, historiana and political hysteria, space capsules, stamps, statuary. These are but a few, only a few, of the thousands of treats that make the Smithsonian the sightseer's bargain in the Star Spangled City. Well, now the sun has set. The sky has turned to orange and pink. It's time to leave the Star Spangled City. Thank you.